What do eight bags of concrete mix, a cooler full of 30-pound sea bass, and a 10-inch compound miter saw have in common? They're all things that are easier to load in and out of the bed of the new F-150. Thanks to its new available pro-access tailgate, that's also a swing gate. The new 2024 Ford F-150, tough this smart, can only be called F-150. Available starting early 2024, pro-access tailgate available starting spring 2024, cargo and load capacity limited by weight and weight distribution. You can make money the hard way becoming a bullfighter or save money the easy way with Xfinity Mobile. It sure beats making money as a human cannonball. Now through March 21st, learn how existing Xfinity customers can get a free line of unlimited intro for a year when they buy one unlimited line. That's hundreds of dollars in savings on your wireless bill. Visit XfinityMobile.com today. Restrictions apply. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. Reduce speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage per line. Data thresholds may vary. For exclusive podcasts and more, sign up at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, he went from being a celebrated human rights activist shining a light on oppression in China to being in Washington on January 6th. How did he get there? We'll discuss the podcast, Dissident at the Doorstep from Crooked Media. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband, I love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Hey, Kevin. Yes. Did you see the complaint in our um, reviews about the fact that I call you the love of my life in our intro? There's a complaint about that? There's a complaint. Is there another love of your life that's no, upset? No, they're like, great commentary, annoying that she calls him the love of her life at the beginning of every episode. But I'm awesome. I'm thinking about cutting it. Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, resident cat lady, and author of The Final Curtain, Laura Bricker. Hey, Laura. Hey, Rebecca. And finally, our substitute captain of all things cynical, the co-founder of the Grab Bag Collab, host of one of the all-time great true crime podcasts, accused and reporter extraordinaire, Amber Hunt. Hello, Amber. Hello. Thank you for having me. Amber, how do you feel about being the substitute captain of all things cynical? You think that that's an appropriate description for you? Are you cynical? Oh, I'm I'm very cynical. I'm not sure I can do it as monotone as Toby, but I'm I'm going to try. <laughs> Probably there'll be more swearing, right? As I'm guessing, than there'll Toby. definitely be more fucking swearing. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have a question for you, Amber. Uh, have you ever heard of double stuff Oreos? Are you kidding? That's all I'm allowed to get in this house? So yes. yes. Have you ever heard of this new thing? I just came downstairs with two Oreos that I believed were double stuff Oreos and I ate them right before we started recording. And I was like, man, there's a lot of stuff in these Oreos. And Kevin informed me that they were in fact called what? I think they're called extreme Oreos. Extreme stuff? Are you sure it's not mega stuff? That's a problem. Mega stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah. If a, a double stuff or mega stuff is acceptable uh, to my 10 year old, anything less than that is garbage. <laughs> Why in my day, our Oreos were just regular stuff. <laughs> there was so much stuff. You had to stuff. twist them apart and then put the filling inside of another one to twist it back together like real Renaissance people. Oh my <laughs> yeah. God. There's so <laughs> much people. stuff in these Oreos. It's like it's like eating a donut in between your Oreo. There's so oh much my. stuff in these Oreos. It's wild. I just wanted to make sure that this was just not something that only was present in our house. All right, so Kevin, this is obviously Monday's program. And it's brought to you by Nabisco. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't. But I will nope. say, those two Oreos were very satisfying. What is coming up on future editions of Crime Writers On? Well, on Thursday, we've got um, we've got a CWO classic rewind. We're going to be going back to our review of Gladiator. Mm -hmm. That was done with Wondery and the Boston Globe about Aaron Hernandez. Not the Russell Crowe film, Gladiator. No, did we talk about Gladiator? (laughs) That Gladiator? We didn't. Why are you just fucking with me? Because I, I think that Russell Crowe film, Gladiator, is so weird. I think it's so weird that it won the Best Picture Oscar. Yes, and the difference is when you give that thumbs down, somebody dies. Yes, Get although it? it's the, the opposite 
in real life. In real life, yeah. Thumbs up meant to Somebody kill the died, guy. Yes. And, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then on Monday, uh, we're coming back with a look at the podcast from WBUR. It's called Beyond All Repair. Can't wait to talk about that one. It's going to be really, really fun. Yeah. Do you guys remember? <laughs> Sorry for the aside. You can tell we're really excited to talk about the podcast we're talking about. Do you guys remember, Amber, do you remember when Russell Crowe ruined Meg Ryan's reputation when they had that affair? This is so funny. <laughs> I was just talking. Uh, so my boyfriend, Scott, and I, we were just talking about this because, oh, we were watching the John Mulaney uh, Baby J special, stand-up special. Yeah. And yeah. there was one funny line where he says that, Likeability is a curse. And I said, oh, Meg Ryan would agree with that because when her reputation went down the tubes because she had this affair, she said it was freeing in a way because being the woman next door character all the time really restricted how she could behave in public and so forth. So, yeah, I, I, I'm familiar. But she got that back, though. I mean, isn't she liked again? I mean, didn't people get over that eventually? Did I they? think they Did got they over it a bit, but then she started doing stuff to her face. I'm yeah, s- sorry. True. I don't mean to comment on, but so, yeah, sometimes yeah. you just less is more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Paging Madonna. Yeah. You want to lean toward the Beyonce level and not toward the, we don't know who you are level, right. I guess. Mm-hmm. Is That's what all. We're... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's you mean. All right. Well, we do have a podcast that we need to discuss. Uh, so should we get to that, Kevin? Let's do it. All right. I'm going to go ahead and drop that first clip right now. Leading off. It wasn't until he was a teenager that Chung Wong Chung had learned to read Braille. But almost as soon as he did, he started teaching himself law. Then he started challenging local officials on behalf of the rural poor and the disabled. Sometimes he even managed to win. Western news outlets became fascinated with Chen Guangcheng, a blind self-taught lawyer who advocated for human rights inside communist China. When Guangcheng escaped house arrest and fled to the U.S. in 2012, he was held up as a symbol of freedom and democracy. He was... Frequently changing his mind, he was often manipulated. He felt that he was being controlled by the people who were actually some of his best friends. Both sides were just hearing what they wanted to hear. No, he thinks for himself. But in subsequent years, observers were puzzled when Guan Chung re-entered the public sphere as a Trump supporter, repeating right-wing talking points. And the humble dissident who stood up to China's government was spotted in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. How did this happen? How did someone who stood for democracy and rule of law in China end up joining an insurrection looking to overturn a U.S. election? The podcast Dissident at the Doorstep from Crooked Media looks at Guan Chung's story, tracing his early advocacy for reproductive freedoms and disability rights to the diplomatic crisis caused by his flight from captivity and his latter day emergence as a right wing darling. Hosts Allison Clayman, Colin Jones, and Yang Yang Chen ask if the man known as the Barefoot Lawyer changed his political stripes or was he misunderstood from the beginning? Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about plot points from Dissident at the Doorstep. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes for a thumbs up or thumbs down reviews. So, Laura, I wouldn't say this podcast is fast paced, would you? Um, No, it lost me a lot because it was it was so slow and deliberate and thorough with all of the information that honestly, it was hard to get through at times. Um, it felt more like a nonfiction book to me than a podcast in the style of writing and narration. Yeah. I will say, though, you know, there are details that stick out that seem like they could have been action scenes. I mean, Amber, I mean, there is this incredible story about uh, Guan Chung's escape from his you know, house arrest. And, you know, what he actually did was pretty extraordinary. I, I, I don't know what your opinion is of this podcast, but I found that long passage of a story that I, I felt like I should have been riveted by um, to sort of be along in the rhythm of this podcast, very drawn out, very long, very detailed. I mean, what did you think overall is sort of the style of this piece of reporting? OK, so it's a really fascinating story, but it's super dry and a lot of people don't have the background in the politics to make it really accessible. So my standpoint has always been that the drier the topic or the more complicated the topic, the more action-focused the narrative should be. 
and the faster paced. And so for me, they lost me, like Laura said, several times. Yes, there was the scene where he's escaping and it's fascinatingly detailed in how he's you know, pulling brick after brick out of a wall and then going through the hole and then realizing that somebody might see him. So he comes back through the hole and it is really fascinating. But the way it's told, even the riveting parts were too dry. Yeah. I don't mind podcasts with multiple hosts. This one had three hosts. However, because there were three hosts and it was so complicated, it added to the difficulty in following the narrative. Uh, so I wish in this case, it, maybe they could have had the three hosts, but maybe those ones like separate the episodes out rather than swapping back and forth throughout an episode. It was very tough for me to keep invested when the voices changed and it was already like pretty heavy stuff to begin with. Yeah. So like maybe someone do like act one, which is the first two or three episodes, act two, something like that, as opposed to always getting two out of the three. Yeah. I mean, I got the sense, Kevin, it's mm-hmm. like. Allison Clayman could have dropped out, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's like, I know that Allison and Colin usually make stuff together, right? But yeah. like, or Colin could have dropped out. No, no offense, Allison. I mean, no, but seriously, the, they didn't both have to be in it if they're going to bring this like excellent Chinese journalist into it who actually brings, I think the most interesting part of the podcast is when she brings her immigrant Chinese perspective into it and talks about her lens. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a through language and her lens through culture and all the lenses through which she's able to see the story differently to me are the most interesting parts of the podcast. I don't need two other white people to balance that out. Yeah, you know, it can be difficult, as Amber said, with three people uh, doing it. And 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 uh, Yang Yang was kind of unceremoniously introduced in the end of episode one. Oh, yeah, there she is. kind of like dropped her in like, oh, OK, after hearing the whole podcast with these two documentarians. And, you know, if you think that Chinese speaking Western documentarians aren't the people who should document a Chinese speaking subject who moved to the West, then Yang Yang is, you know, probably fine. She's like you said, she's able to bring some personal insights about Chinese identity that were interesting, probably the best part of the podcast. But even those sides felt a little forced kind of shoehorned into particular situations. Each time I hear the audio or even read the transcripts, my mind shuts down. It's like my subconscious is trying to protect me from further harm. I find myself feeling offended on behalf of Guangcheng, as a fellow Chinese person, by the patronizing tone. She's more of an academic than a first-person journalist, so they didn't quite go with it, I think. But, you know, whether Asian or American, the best people to tell this story are people who could tell it well. Hmm. And I I just don't think this is what happened here. Yeah. So I just want to throw a bigger question out. Because this is from Crooked Media. We know that Crooked Media was established by like former Obama people. Like mm-hmm. they, they don't make any bones about the fact that they are, you know, liberals with a capital L, right? Like, yeah, and they disclose that's in a very casual but, absolutely. but explicit way. Yeah. Absolutely. But I will, I will tell you something. And one thing that sort of troubles me about political reporting generally and like the politics lens generally is that there is this incredulous sort of approach of like, People becoming Trump supporters like still Mm -hmm. in 2024, people are like, how could this be? We know how it could be. I mean, the the bottom line is, you know, I just taped an episode yesterday of a podcast that I work on called Civics 101. And like we talked through Joe Biden's campaign promises versus Donald Trump's campaign promises, not not their rhetoric, their actual promises. And Donald Trump's promises are very easy to understand. And, And Joe Biden's promises are very wonky and complicated to understand. And aside from all of the things that we might find disdainful and dark, about Trump ideology, there is an appeal to things that people can kind of get to grasp onto. And the idea that, you know, somebody who is from China, who is a dissident, why on earth could they become a Trump supporter? To me, that's almost like a false premise. Like, why wouldn't he become a Trump supporter? And that's a very lefty liberal way to sort of take it. Like, just just the assumption that, quote, normal, regular people wouldn't be into Donald Trump when we actually have categorical proof that lots of normal, regular people are into Donald Trump. And I want to dig deep into this at some point in the podcast, but about it is sort of like people see what they want to see in this particular person because the Chinese political positions don't neatly fall with this as the same as American ones do. But as far as like, you know, your setup to your your own statement here is that it sort of gives the promise that this 
podcast is a radicalization story. Yeah. And you could like argue like whether or not that's actually what happened. We are very, I mean, it's, you know, like, oh, because we know at the end is he goes to Washington on January 6th. And like the journey to get there is so long. And then what they talk about his involvement on January 6th, just in Washington, not at the Capitol. I was a little disappointed in like how narratively that that played out. Wong Chung was in the back of my mind that day. So while we were watching footage of people storming the Capitol, I had the thought to check his Twitter account. I'd wanted to see what his take was. And what I found was a series of videos he posted of himself at the rally near the White House, standing amid a crowd as yellow don't tread on me flags waved overhead. You know, and as someone who needs assistance to travel, it would have been really interesting to figure out who got him there. What organization? Was he there on his own? Was, again, there's all this discussion that maybe he's a pawn for somebody. But we, we think this is going to be a radicalization story. And it's where he got it was not radicalized. It was maybe he was there the whole time. Yeah. And a lot of people just didn't see it that way. Yeah. It was interesting to me how the very first episode took that for granted, that idea that you must have been radicalized to believe this. And it was it was done in a really weird way. I didn't as a journalist, of course, I have personal opinions and I might have questions in my head about, you know, somebody who follows a certain ideology. But when we're digging into that, it's like when an actor takes a role of a villain, they're supposed to adopt that they're the hero of the story. Right. So the journalist to me is supposed to set aside that like personal animosity toward an ideology and and just go okay so a lot of people might think that it's a big leap to go from here to here is it you know but the way it was worded was very um forceful like uh it went against everything i believed in or something like it was very judgmental that's the word i'm looking for the judgmental yes i think the most interesting part of the podcast laura later is when yang yang kind of like tears that apart and talks about how guan chung was actually you know all these liberals talk about how he's being used by all these Republicans, but he was also very much being kind of put in a box by all of these white liberal people who brought him over and were like, okay, now it's time for you to learn how to go grocery shopping. And now it's time for you to like conform to this very American way of life and become a teacher. And, and they're like, he's a super asshole. And then we hear young young say like, maybe he's a super asshole because of the way that you guys are dealing with him. I don't know. I found that to be like the more interesting part of the podcast, but also sort of like laying it over with the assumption that no one should be a Trump supporter. I'm not saying that like people should or shouldn't, but like that is a weird assumption to make about a human being in addition to like seeing it through that cultural lens. I don't know. I'm maybe not making any sense. No, you're making sense. I think, and I think it's because we associate, I mean, I guess as I'm listening to it, I'm associating his coming to the U.S. as being more facilitated by sort of a liberal arm of people. And then, you know, he gets here and he's like, you know, they're talking about these parties that he's at. And at one point they're like, and I was at the urinal and Richard Branson was next to me. We first met Wang Chung at one of these, a black tie gala Condé Nast traveler held at Lincoln Center. That was probably the most glittery event I've been to in the city. Susan Sarandon and Michael Bloomberg were there. I remember standing at the urinal and then realizing that the guy next to me was Sir Richard Branson. All the people that are like glomming onto him once he's here and he's kind of being put out there as, I wouldn't say a puppet, but sort of as this like trophy of like, look at this person that we have rescued and that we have here now. And then like I'm thinking about, I'm like, okay. You hear Trump, I like my son used to do this great Trump impersonation and he always used to be like, China. So I'm like, of course, yeah. of course, like it makes sense. Okay, we're thinking he's about women's rights because of the way that he was standing up for women in these forced abortions and sterilizations. And then you're like, of course, he's now going to be courted by the people in the right because that seems like pro-life to them. Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. But there is definitely this sort of like, on feeling about who is eventually going to get hold of him after hearing this story of his escape. I mean, that escape was like something straight out of like a Jason Bourne movie. I mean, like, you know, like driving to the embassy and putting the fake the pillows in the bed to make it seem like he was there and all that stuff. That was the hook right off on this podcast of like, how could he go from this to this? But that doesn't really take into account the full picture of who this person was. 
Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is, I mean, it's really incredible. And by the way, I just want to say to our audience, like my newsroom doesn't use the word blind when we describe people with visual impairment, but that's how the podcast describes him over and over and over again. But they describe this, quote, blind man who cannot see crossing roads like on his hands and knees leaving the village like crawling along walls ducking behind bushes and i'm like i have to ask the question how does he know what side of the bush to duck behind when he literally cannot see it actually is quite an incredible image right it absolutely is you can join us on patreon <laughs> at patreon.com slash partners in crime what media. a transition kevin yeah i didn't know what else to do there uh, <laughs> well you can listen if you're visually impaired you can listen That's anywhere it. yes you can listen anywhere with shoes on you can be barefoot That's right you can listen you, you can, can be a lawyer uh so you can get great stuff at our patreon you can listen to the crime writers on after show on this after show you know what we're going to be doing what we're going to be talking to a, a really famous podcaster really Pulitzer Prize winner. Ooh, who's that? Uh, James Beard Award winner. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Amber Hunt. <laughs> so all the great stuff Amber has going on, including her own Patreon That's network. That's Marsha Chatlin who won the James Beard Award. I know, but sh- Marsha's not here. Amber is. <laughs> it's the best we could do. <laughs> also got some good stuff. We got Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast. Toby is away on a beach someplace reading The Assassination of Fred Hampton by Jeffrey Haas. That'll be his next Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club. Laura Bricker belongs to a book club, and she talked all about it in the latest episode of Leave It to Bricker. Laura, what is the name of your crazy book club? The No Rules Book, Gun, Smut, and Saber Club. And at the most recent meeting of our club that actually happened two nights ago, we had two swords. It was very exciting, and I got to unsheath one of them. It was like taking the little sword condom off. It was very exciting. No, no, we're, we're talking literal swords here, right? That's not code for anything, right? No, no, literal swords. Because you did swords. say smut, and you said there were two yeah, well, swords. there was also smut. There was also a smutty book that I am now in possession of um, that I can't even discuss because it's so smutty. Oh, mm. it's about pork swords. Pork swords? No, it's oh, about Rebecca. dragon sex or something. Dragon really sex. really something. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Okay, how is that smutty? That just sounds like a weird fantasy book. Because the dragon has two penises. <laughs> okay, here's the question. Oh, uh, like, like next to each other or on top of each other? Like, would you be okay, like on the left and the right? Yet. Or I think it would be like symmetry. It'd have to be one on the a, left, one on the right. a whole new definition to scissoring, right? I, yes, yeah. Two penises. There's a lot. There's a lot happening, and I will let you know as soon as I finish the book because um, I still did not really understand it based on the description I got. But you can learn about my book club in the Patreon episode. All right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, other things we have include Mary with Podcast, our advice show, and elsewhere in Crime Writers on World, we have the latest episode of These Are Their Stories, the Law and Order podcast. We look at a very recent episode. Episode, uh, in which a politician's husband is beaten to death inside her home, but it's really about trans kids. So they're jamming everything into this episode. Have a quick listen. Why is it everybody was running away from him in this episode? Like, I just want to talk. Even the kid, like, ran out of school yep. and then into the street like he's baby Noah. Almost and, died. Yeah, almost get hit by a car. I mean, <laughs> if only that had happened to yeah. baby Noah. Oh, I'm sorry. Man. Is that too soon? Am I not supposed to? You, you could shit on baby Noah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like talking about the baby Jesus. It's like a whole different kind of Jesus, right? Forget, you know, there's older goes to dance class Noah, and then there's baby Noah who would fucking swallow a quarter, and it'd be like a whole two part episode. Also, want to let you know that um, we're actually going on hiatus on these other stories. Our ninth season will begin in July. We've done. 201 episodes in a row, and so we're like finally taking a break. You're taking a break. I'm taking a break. I'm going to keep making it in your absence. Okay, well, we'll still have episodes. The Rebecca-only uh, episodes of these are their stories with no jokes, no jokes, no sound effects, none of the Kevin Flynnness. Just, just hot, kidding. Just hot takes about baby Noah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kevin, before we end the business section, do we have any Patreon patron saints of the week this week? Our Patreon patron saints are Trevor Strickland and Mark Peralta. Bless you. And all uh, male contingent in our Patreon patron saints. This is very exciting. I think it might might be a first. We don't don't discriminate, Rebecca. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you, Mark. We really appreciate your patronage, and we appreciate everybody who's a patron, and everybody even who isn't. And we mostly just appreciate you muscling through the business section. Kevin, can I fade that music out now? Please do. I'm going to go ahead and get that done. 
You can make money the hard way becoming a bullfighter. Or save money the easy way with Xfinity Mobile. It sure beats making money as a human cannonball. Now through March 21st, learn how existing Xfinity customers can get a free line of unlimited intro for a year when they buy one unlimited line. That's hundreds of dollars in savings on your wireless bill. Visit XfinityMobile.com today. Restrictions apply. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. Reduced speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage per line. Data thresholds may vary. Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus, a central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. Amber Hunt. So yes. they bring Guan Chung over to the United States to give him this fellowship slash teaching situation slash learning situation at NYU with no real plan or structure for what he will actually do when he gets there. And then they call him ungrateful and complain that he's not doing anything when he's there. <laughs> Did that strike you as, um, I don't know, dickish? Because it struck me as kind of dickish. Get a job, hippie. <laughs> yeah, all of, it, all of it struck me as very uncomfortable and... Like, I'm not sure what they were expecting. He really, he went from one restricted situation kind of into another where he's not free to do exactly as he pleases. He has these expectations put upon him. And yeah, I guess he didn't act precisely the way that they thought he should. Did you buy the story of his handler? There was this weird anecdote with the train station in D.C. where he says, I mean, I think the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. But he basically says he was just trying to meet friends. And she says, no, he was going to go protest at the Chinese embassy. And that would have been terrible for diplomatic relations. And he says she was keeping me captive. And she says, no, I wasn't. But it was my responsibility to maintain diplomatic relations between China and the U.S. And I was I mean, that didn't that pretty much seem like. They, she literally was keeping him from going out and hanging out with those people, whether or not it was dinner or a protest at the Chinese embassy. Yeah, exactly. I do not like covering politics because nobody says what they actually fucking mean. And to me, that is just infuriating. And that's what it felt like. It felt like he was saying something pretty plainly. And then she was saying the same thing, but in a much fancier language that made it sound like maybe it wasn't quite true. But really, when you cut through it, Sounded like you weren't letting him go. So, yeah. Yeah. I hate politics. You know, it occurred to me that his sort of worldview is always that the government is oppressive. Now, that is certainly true in China, but it certainly seemed like every time there was something going on that he believed it was like Obama personally trying to keep him off of that train. And it was sort of, sort of like this institutional paranoia that all eyes are on you, you know, sort of this exceptionalism that you are the center of this political universe. And so I think that he would see the idea of like, um, Kevin. you know, that it was somebody way up on high and not the person who's escorting him to the train station and said, maybe that's not a good idea. Maybe that, you know, he believed that, that he equated the heavy handed tactics of the Chinese Communist Party with the electoral political apparatus in the U.S. Kevin, I just want to point out that he was, in fact, being manipulated by an incredibly powerful institution, which is the Democratic National Committee and Party. They squirreled him away to George Soros's fucking house to keep him from going to an event that he wanted to go to with the Republicans to keep him from somehow interfering with the election. As It's like this dude had opinions that they didn't like. We might not like his opinions either. But he came to the United fucking States where you were allowed to have whatever goddamn opinions you want. And they kept him from being able to travel freely and express those opinions. And that is wild to me. 
Well, of course he thinks that Obama did it. Before that, though, before he was actually like not allowed to do what he wanted to do, he was in the embassy and they were offering him a deal. And according to the podcast, his thinking was that Obama personally was putting the relationship between the U.S. and China above his well-being, like he was being singled out specifically there. And that's the point where I started to go like, okay, but so he's always going to be put upon in his mind. Now, the fact that he was put upon in a lot of situations is also true, but I don't know that every single situation needed to be interpreted that way. Yeah. But I, I don't think he was necessarily Thank wrong. Thank you for agreeing with me, Amber Hunt. I know. It felt yeah, really weird, Kevin. felt real weird. <laughs> I don't think he was necessarily wrong that he was an international political pawn because he was right. an international political Like, pawn. both things can be true, though, that on in one hand, in his mental narration, he was always the victim, but also in several situations, he definitely was victimized. Exactly, exactly. So, Laura, we do get some voiceover translation in the podcast, and we hear why we get the voiceover translation in the podcast. But then later, there's an episode talking about the nuance when you do that and what it takes away and what it means. And we do hear a lot about language in the podcast, which I think is actually interesting, about trying to Americanize uh, foreign language speakers, get rid of their accents and so forth. But let's just talk about the mechanics of that itself. Would you have preferred listening to Guan Chung speaking English in his uh, interviews? Or did you think that the narration worked? Do you think they should have used a different narrator? I'm just curious to know what you think. So for me, I think my issue is it didn't work for me. And I was trying to think why that was. And I feel like it's because we already had so many different voices. Like we had the three hosts and now we have, oh, we now have him, but this isn't really him. This is now the translator person who's... Um, translating what he said when we spoke to him. And so for me, it just felt like more confusion, honestly. And I understand that this was a way to get a much more accurate sort of representation from him of what he went through and his story and like his answers to questions. But I think had the podcast been structured differently with maybe one host or two hosts, or maybe the writing had been broken up in a little bit like snappier way, It would have been okay, but it just felt even more bogged down to me when we now added one more voice into this podcast. Hmm. Uh, Amber, what do you think that Guan Chung is doing at American University? Because they seem very tolerant of him not teaching anything or doing anything there. Well, he's barefoot. He's on the side of the desk. He's the cool teacher. He's probably passing out the pot. (laughs) He's the cool teacher. And we heard this thing, Kevin, where like, He's going to be maybe teaching a course on how he survived during house arrest by, yeah. it's like, that, that's not going to be that's a not, class. What a great syllabus that is. <laughs> Plus he has a whole like podcast of his own where he already talks about that stuff. So yeah. A podcast that nobody listens to and a YouTube channel that nobody watches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a term, you know, that we use, it's called, you know, getting a pig in a poke. I don't remember where it comes from, <laughs> what? but it kind of means like you're taking a chance on getting something, buying something, and that you might end up getting a lemon ah. to mix a whole bunch of metaphors here. Yeah, you're mixing a lot of metaphors. Mix it. It's okay. That's how I roll, man. <laughs> um, <and laughs> that's my love language. That's how he and moves his tea. <laughs> that's how I... <laughs> that's what yeah, floats so, his I mean, lawn. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a lot, you know, again, it was like, we think if we bring him into the country, we bring him to our university, if we bring him into our fraternal organization, this is what we're getting. And we're not getting that. And maybe it's not like so harsh to say, yeah, he's kind of being a gold brick. Just kind of like, yeah, I'm here and somebody should pay me a million dollars for my book. Otherwise, I guess it's President Obama that's keeping me from getting that deal. And I don't want to teach a class. There was sort of hot, great expectations for what he would do and what he would mean for the American political scene. And he did not meet those expectations, whether it was reasonable to believe that he would or not. Yeah. You know, I will say. I don't believe that President Obama personally interfered with the stuff that happened later at all, obviously. It is like weird, though, I will say. I don't understand people like when given a very easy question to answer that they could easily debunk something they don't. It's like we hear that, oh, well, the guy that was handling him or whatever was President Obama's former staffer. And we asked him and he said he didn't remember. 
And I'm like, just say no. <laughs> just fucking say no. Because when you say you don't remember, everyone thinks that's a lie. Because that's what the people say on the stand in court when they're lying. They say, I don't remember. That's just my opinion. If you want to debunk something, be clear. Say no. Say no. It's so funny. I just used an example this week where when somebody said they didn't remember and I was asked if this person seemed credible, I said, actually, it did feel credible because they answered what they knew. And if they didn't know something, they just didn't answer because they didn't know the answer. Right. No, I don't mean like honest people saying they don't remember. I mean, the kind of people who are like, I don't recall. You know, those kind of, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those kind of, okay. Those okay. Kind of people. <laughs> hey, can um, I ask so a Kevin, question? Of course. I was curious what other people thought about uh, Christian Bale being the first yeah. episode. Well, I thought episode one was very different than the rest of the series. That episode felt active. You know, they're going to this award ceremony. They're telling this crazy Christian Bale story. Christian Bale getting punched in the face. I turned around at one point while I was trying to fend off one of the security people to see Christian dodging a a hail of, of blows, but with his camera out and filming it at the same time. As we leave, the guards give chase in their car. They're still right on our tail. I mean, who hasn't wanted to punch Christian Bale in the face, right? <laughs> uh, I don't, the Joker? Uh, it felt like, I mean, it really felt like what we were going to be getting in the series was like a political, sociological investigation kind of thing. How did he change politically? Why did he do that? Was he radicalized? But it turned into primarily into the, like this biography of seven more episodes, and it just plotted along. And I was like, He's just leaving China now, and this is episode four. <laughs> I mean, oh my god! You yeah, know, so yeah, this thing did not need to be as long as it was. Yeah, so I couldn't listen to it when I was driving because I might. I, that's really mean. I'm not going to say that. Yeah, oh, no, you can say you, you couldn't listen to it you were driving <laughs> because it would make you. It drowsy. would make me nod off because yeah. it was so monotonous at times. Yeah, I listened to this one at one and a half. I'm not going to lie because that was the only way I I could. Um, but I will say, like, the one thing that didn't surprise me. Okay, there is a hubris that I will say that these kind of media makers, liberals with liberal L's have sort of assuming like the rightness of of themselves and like the, the normalcy of their point of view that like there should be no surprise that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I think I see zero percent surprise in that. Right. And it's like this giant revelation and it just should not take us eight episodes to get there. Kevin, were you surprised that the enemy of my enemy is my friend is basically the key to this whole mystery? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. We talked about sort of like where they come down on certain issues. And it's like, he's the advocate against forced abortion in China. He doesn't and, care about women's rights, though. Well, you know, the left is like, they hear, oh, forced, and they don't like that. And the right hears abortion, and they don't like that. And so they think, oh, he's our guy on that. And like when they're talking about democracy... I think primarily those of us on the left see the government as a tool to achieve freedom and things like human rights and women's rights and civil rights. And, you know, when it works well, the government is supposed to be a champion for the people when it works well. Uh, So they're all like about human rights. He must be one of us. And to the right and for Guangchang, the government stands in the way of freedom. So while you don't equate the right with civil rights in the U.S., Guangchang has always sort of viewed the government as inherently authoritarian. And I believe this is sort of like the fault line between the two Western political tribes and why the left completely misinterpreted who this guy was. Yes, and they also missed the point that he didn't like black people. (laughs) And he doesn't like gay people. (laughs) Doesn't like trans people, gay people, or black people. They kind of missed that in their oppo research that they did about this guy. Uh, And yet they put him right in the middle of one of the most liberal college campuses in the country and expected it to be a tremendous success. Amazing that that didn't work out. <laughs> Truly amazing. He said, I don't see race. <laughs> he, did. He, he did, literally. That's not. He literally nobody did. Nobody needs to send a letter on that. He said, no, he I'm did. blind. I do not see race. He literally did say that. <laughs> he did. And you don't, you don't have to add us because the podcaster himself pointed out how yeah. kind of absurd that was. Yeah. Of course, he doesn't see yeah. race. And then right? it was always followed with, but. Yes. Oh, yes. And but every interaction I've ever had with black people has been horrible. Why are they so angry? (laughs) Something like that. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Exactly. You can make money the hard way becoming a bullfighter or save money the easy way with Xfinity Mobile. It sure beats making money as a human cannonball. Now through March 21st, learn how existing Xfinity customers can get a free line of unlimited intro for a year when they buy one unlimited line. That's hundreds of dollars in savings on your wireless bill. Visit XfinityMobile.com today. 
Restrictions apply. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. Reduce speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage per line. Data thresholds may vary. Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus is central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions. Luxury is meant to be livable. Discover the new leather collection at Ashley with premium quality leather sofas, recliners, and more, all built to last. No matter how many spills, scuffs, or pet-related mishaps come its way, the leather collection at Ashley is made with the durability you need for the whole family. Shop the new leather collection at Ashley and find chairs starting at $499.99 and sofas at $599.99. Ashley, for the love of home. All right, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they check out the podcast Dissident at the Doorstep from Crooked Media? Laura Bricker, what do you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down for this podcast? So uh, this is unfortunately a thumbs down for me. I don't know why I say unfortunately. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the first episode, I thought this was going to be kind of an interesting story. You know, I was like, oh, this, this is something I could learn about. Um, but as it went along, I really had a hard time following the story because it was just so dense. And there was three hosts and there was just too much going on. And I think if there had been different writing and they had rethought the way that they used the hosts, it could have been put in a way that for me felt more compelling, but unfortunately thumbs down, couldn't do it. Amber Hunt, what do you think about Dissident at the Doorstep? Thumbs up or thumbs down for this podcast? I actually understand Lara's unfortunately, because I like learning new things. I like learning about history. I think that when it's done well in an engaging way, it can really open your eyes and and add a new like layer to your understanding of the world. This one for me, because it was so dense, by all means, like if it's a topic that you're interested in, go check it out. But as a general, I'm going to just go find a podcast. But it's a thumbs down. Kevin Flynn. Yeah, I'm going thumbs down. I, I can't remember anything that was so thoroughly researched that seemed so empty. <laughs> it- That's fair. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I see the podcast. It's like a, it's like a mega stuff Oreo. Uh, I mean, just, it was really boring. I just have to say, like, the, I respect the idea that, you know, had like very thoughtful people put the time in that they even got the subject himself to like talk a long time about what his story was and they, they parsed it up. But it really just didn't hold my interest either. I, every episode was sort of 10 minutes too long. Uh, it didn't have any sharp edges to sort of grab onto, right? And I think that two of the three uh, producers here are film documentarians, it sounds like. And this might have made a really interesting film. But as far as like sustaining over, was it nine, eight, nine episodes? Eight, I forget how many episodes. Too many, eight epi- episodes. Too many episodes. Yeah, the, this story just sort of like plotted along. It just wasn't great. To me, it was a real disappointment. Thumbs down. Yeah, thumbs down for me too. Not only was this podcast boring, I found it to be incredibly smug. And I also, by the way, am so tired of reporting that is looking at how somebody became a MAGA person, why somebody became a MAGA person. Enough, 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 enough. The bottom line is where we are, where we are. I don't know if you guys have heard about the 2025 project. Kevin, have you heard about the 2025 project? I have, yes. Yes, this is a Trump campaign promise to basically fire Everyone in the United States government, civil workers, all the way up through public officials who disagree with him politically. Mm -hmm. This is the campaign promise. This is a fascist promise on its face. It's a fascist in my opinion. That's actually what it is. This is what we should be reporting on, right? We should be reporting on what is happening now. Uh, If you want to report on something about like authoritarianism and how people are looking at it and the lenses through which we should be exploring it, report on where we are, where we could go and like what we can do about it. I think the I think the story of how people got and why they support what they do. It's a story that's been told. I think what's really important for journalists to do now is help people who believe anything that they want to, because people have very good reasons for believing what they do. And I'm not going to sit here and be smug and say that all Trump supporters are stupid because they're not. They have very, very good 
messaging and marketing. They found a message that they can hold on to. And that is what's happening. And the journalism that we need now needs to be journalism that explains and that will sort of tell us what is going to happen and what the fuck we can do about it. And I just think this was a huge waste of resources for, for Crooked Media to do. I'm not saying it's an unimportant story or an uninteresting story, but it's a long ass story. And it was a lot of hours that I spent learning something that I feel like could have been told to me in an hour, basically. The one thing I'll say, though, is I think Toby would have liked it. I think it had Toby vibes. So I'm just going to say Toby's in for a thumb sideways. I yeah, think. he would have been thumb sideways. I'm just yeah. going to say I can see Toby saying something like this ticks a lot of my boxes because that's the kind of thing he says when he listens to stuff like this. But yeah, it's a thumbs down for me. It ticks a lot of my boxes. <laughs> Is that good? Yeah, very, good. very good. Yeah. Thumbs down for me for dissident at the doorstep. Now it's time for my favorite part of the podcast. A little something I like to call the crime of the week. The crime of the week. Just like the thousands of people who've used DNA to learn their ancestry, pet owners can use cutting-edge science to get a report on their dog's breed. For between $80 and $200, several companies promise a highly accurate analysis of your pooch's pedigree. WBZ investigative reporter Christina Hager put that claim to the test by swabbing her own cheek and asking for the results. While two companies said the sample was no good, DNA my dog to the TV journalist was 40% Alaskan Malamute. Furthermore, it claimed she was 35% Sharpay and 25% Labrador. (laughs) The station did the same thing a year ago, and DNA my dog identified a human as a mix of Border Collie, Cane Corso, and Bulldog. The company stands by the accuracy of its test for dogs. It says their equipment is not designed for human DNA, which which messes up its algorithm and produces incorrect results. But is that analysis really that wrong? Sounds like this investigative reporter is just the right mix of bloodhound and bulldog. So panel, your DNA tests are in. What are the shocking results? Lara Bricker. I mean, clearly this is not shocking to anybody that I am more than 50% cat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Amber Hunt, what do you think? What are your shocking DNA results? I think I've got some Dalmatian in me. Oh, what do you think, Kevin mm. Flynn? I'm 100% that bitch. <laughs> oh, okay. But I'm also a 16% double stuff Oreo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's going to do it for us. But before we go, Laura Bricker, I have to ask, do we have a cat of the week this week? <laughs> So for our cat of the week this week, sent in by Samantha Axtell in our Crime Writers on Facebook discussion group, Animal Adventures in Bolton, Mass. Brought this beautiful Eurasian owl named Petra to my friend's photography studio today for a mini photo shoot. Kimberly Ann Empowerment Photography in Hanover, Massachusetts took beautiful photos. I, of course, wear my The Owl Did It t-shirt. Petra weighs in at about 8.5 pounds, has a five-foot wingspan, and he was one of the rock stars posing with everyone today. And here's one of Kimberly's photos and my favorite selfie of the experience, which has her in the Owl Did It t-shirt with the owl. So I'm a big fan of this photo. And um, if you come see us at the Word Barn next month for our live show, you too can get an owl shirt. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Owl Cat of the Week. All right, Laura Bricker, folks want to reach out to you and pitch any kind of animal to be Cat of the Week. How can they find you online? They can find me at Lara Bricker on Twitter and Instagram. Amber Hunt, where can you be found? Where can folks follow you? You know, where I'd like you to follow me right now is at Grab Bag Collab, which is our Patreon account. That's where I release early ad-free episodes of Crimes of the Centuries, uh, which, by the way, this whole podcast series would have made a great single episode of Crimes of the Centuries. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You can also find me at Reporter Amber on all the... All the things. Kevin Flynn. I'm a Kevin P. Flynn. And if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, find me at Reb Lavoy. Follow the show everywhere at Crime Writers On and please join our incredible community in our official, very healthy, non-toxic, official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. Just go to find us on regular Facebook, hit join the group. We'll let you in if you're not jerky. Get episodes early and ad-free at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. You'll also get the Crime Writers On After Show, Mary with Podcast, Laura Bricker's Leave It to Bricker Podcast, and Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcast. Our theme song was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the terrific Livy Burdett. The executive producer of this program is Kevin Flynn. 
This show was recorded in the Treehouse Yoga Studio above the Mockingbird Cafe in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi Studio, otherwise known as Studio C, The Closet, in our New Hampshire basement, where we also always want to punch Christian Bale right in his stupid fucking face. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. later. Laura Bricker, I have to ask, do we have a Cat of the Week this week? We do. Hold on. I wasn't sure how we, how we were doing that since we're doing two. Hold on a minute. Cat of the Week. Do, Laura, do, you have one fucking job. I, no, I know, but I know we're doing... I'm joking! We're doing joking. two this week. I didn't know if we were I doing know. two back You've to back. You've got two fucking jobs. Two fucking mm. jobs. Okay. You can make money the hard way becoming a bullfighter or save money the easy way with Xfinity Mobile. It sure beats making money as a human cannonball. Now through March 21st, learn how existing Xfinity customers can get a free line of unlimited intro for a year when they buy one unlimited line. That's hundreds of dollars in savings on your wireless bill. Visit XfinityMobile.com today. Restrictions apply. Xfinity Mobile requires Xfinity Internet. Reduce speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage per line. Data thresholds may vary.